Now let's get the, there we go. Wow. It's good to see you this morning and it's going to be great to do this and to do this and to look at the camera. Because Terry tells me every, he helps me, I need to look at the camera. Good morning. And, uh, you see our title today is Demolishing Strongholds and many times because through scripture and uh, legitimately uh, we have this this concept of kind of going up against the so to speak the gates of hell we see these monstrosities these uh, castle type structures these big gates with a moat almost and we, we think about strongholds but there are other strongholds that uh, we are engaged with that many times we don't really even consider and probably are the most important and so today I would just like to start reading from Romans chapter 7 from the Message Bible and uh, maybe you can relate to this. I hope everyone can. Apostle Paul wrote, I know the law, but still can't keep it. And if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but when I do it anyway, my decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up, and I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of, my, all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. Can anyone relate to that? Yeah. And it doesn't matter what the arena is. It doesn't matter what the struggle is, or the stronghold. And then Paul, Paul wrote this, and he says, I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. And I want you to remember this question, because we're going to bring it up towards the end. Is there no one who can do anything for me? And we'll take a look at the answer a little later. And again, there's a war that's going on within us while we are in these bodies. Sometimes the NIV will have a sinful nature. Uh, the word is sarx in the Greek. It uh, means flesh. And the point is this. And it doesn't matter what the area is that we're struggling with. It could be anything. You know, too many Twinkie. I mean, you name it. It could be anything. The point is, while we're in these bodies, there is going to be this wrestling going on uh, with, between God and between the Spirit and sometimes even our mind. There's a battle going on. And uh, even as Christians, we still have that battle, don't we? I mean, this is the Apostle Paul, who is so uh, transparent so that, you know, I don't know, Sunday mornings, you know, we can be a little pencil neck, we can look pretty good, and everyone, you know, I'm okay, you're okay, and sometimes we can admit this, you know, uh, if, if you were a real Christian, you're not going to be wrestling with anything, you're not going to be having any problems, you're not going to get depressed, you're not going to have, you're not going to get ugly for a moment, right? You know, and I, I know you guys, you can get pretty ugly. You know, <laughs> nah, I can get pretty ugly. Sometimes, honestly, what I do sometimes, uh, I'll think to myself when I'm thinking or something, I think, man, Jim, that's really ugly. Oh, 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 really bad, yeah. And so we do this wrestling, don't we? We wrestle with things. And it doesn't matter. I mean, we all have different things. And we have to be careful lest we get conceited and, and cocky uh, because we, the things that we wrestle with, uh, they're not like what other people wrestle with. You know, some people, they're wrestling with this. And, wow, how could they wrestle with that? We don't have a problem with that. But we have our own issues, right? And so we have to be careful that we're not in the same camp as the Pharisee. Uh, who was in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Some of you remember this. Uh, we read that two men went to pray. One was a Pharisee, one was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood alone and prayed, God, I thank you. I'm not like other people who steal, cheat, or take part in adultery, or even like that tax collector. I give up eating twice a week, and I give one-tenth of everything I get. But we know the tax collector, standing at a distance, would not even look up to heaven, but he beat on his chest because he was so sad. And he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
And Jesus said, I tell you, when this man went home, he was right before God, but the Pharisee was not. All who make themselves great will be humbled, but all who make themselves humble will be made great, right? So we always have to be careful that maybe uh, somebody's wrestling with something, and that's not our issue, but that is a true stronghold for them. And we have to be graceful. We have to be truthful, but we have to be graceful and shared in love. And we have our own issues if we're honest, if we're transparent. The Apostle Paul had opponents, it seems, wherever he went wherever he took the gospel. And there were false teachers, and I think especially in Corinth, there was this harassing agent of false teachers that were attacking Paul, would basically be infiltrating and attacking the church in Corinth. And we have these false teachers and their followers accusing Paul of living according to the flesh, actually. Motivated by evil self-interest. And there was and is this battlefield that many of us fight in Christianity. And what happens is the world is coming towards us, and they can be pretty mean, can't they? The weapons that they use, the ways that they use, are very effective. But ultimately not effective. Because they have their full array, but we have our own weapons. We have our own weapons, and they are more than adequate as we put them on and use them. So what we're going to take a look at today, I would say, is a principle. It's a principle for strongholds of the enemy of Christ, but also, I think, first has to be exercised in us. I think this principle works for us first with the strongholds that we are dealing with and then with the strongholds of the world. Does that make sense? Make sense? How many are sleeping? Come on. Okay. All right. All right. Because, you know, this is a spiritual battle. We war the spirit and the flesh. That's, again, the reason why we get these new bodies one day. We won't be wrestling with that type of thing. So let's see how Paul addresses this issue of these opponents who say Paul is living um, in the flesh. He's greedy. He's prideful. All these things of the flesh. Again, we need to keep this context. Because the world is using their weapons against Paul. And this is how Paul responds. Paul responds, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. In the original language, the NIV doesn't do the, the, the best rendition here. It says, for though we live in the flesh, meaning we're in these bodies. We do not wage war, very important, as the world does, or in a fleshy way, meaning like the world does. And so it's interesting that uh, there's a play on words because these false teachers have accused Paul of walking in the flesh, in the moral sense, driven by greed and by pride and being corrupt. And he kind of makes a play on this word. And that, yes, we are in these physical bodies in a sense, but we do not do battle like the world does. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? In whom the Spirit of God dwells. But there is a war going on with the world and, what, and the person, the entity behind all, so many things, which is the devil. In Ephesians 6, we read that Paul said our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness in heavenly places. So we know that there is our dynamic demonic forces in, 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 in play here, but also the world as they are caught up in this lie. And this is where we're going to be taking a look at strongholds, the idea of getting caught up in the lie. So Paul says how we do this as believers. We do not uh, live in the world, in the flesh. We do not wage war as, in a fleshy way as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. This is the weapons, our weapons, to demolish what? Strongholds. To what? And I like the, this idea of the uh, definition of strongholds by uh, John MacArthur. Because this is the real battleground. This is it. And I like uh, MacArthur's definition. Strongholds defined as human or demonic thoughts, opinions, reasonings, I just want to ask you, 
Do you think today, if you pay any attention to what's going on today in the world, in our country, do you see the reasonings and the opinions that are floating all over the place that are not based on the knowledge of God, but just kind of floating around, right? I don't know where they came from. So defined as human, uh, demonic thoughts, opinions, reasonings, concepts of the world, philosophies, theories, psychologies, perspectives, viewpoints, and even sometimes religion. This is the battlefield. This is the stronghold of the world. And so Paul writes, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power, these weapons that we have as Christians, to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take what? Captive. Captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And that's a little bit of work, isn't it? To take something captive, especially our own thoughts. I was sharing this morning, maybe you've done this too. Have you ever been praying and you're thinking, boy, I feel so close to God right now. Man, I just, I'm, right, I'm zeroed in, right? I'm like a razor's edge. I'm like a laser, okay? And all of a sudden you're praying and you think about meatloaf. <laughs> Have you ever done this? Like, think about meatloaf. Or if you say, go back, you know, and then and you're praying and say, man, okay, I'm back there, I'm back in, I'm in, okay, good. And then you're thinking about, I don't talk, well, you know, how that happens, you just, our minds go off. So to take something captive, it, it takes work. It's an exercise. But Paul says, we demolish arguments and every pretension, and here's the battleground that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive Every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And you know, I, I really have this, you know, I don't know if it's a theory, but this thought, and I think you would agree that no matter how we look at it, it doesn't much matter what generation, what century, it all goes back to the garden. You have three players. You have God, you have man, and you have the devil, right? And we are either going to keep our, our minds and our thoughts captive to what God says or to the devil. This has been a, from the beginning of time, this has been the battle. Their spiritual war is with demons. I, I, don't, I do not discard that. But even more so, it is for the minds of people. For the minds of people who are captured in the lie. Opposing the knowledge of God. And so I think this principle... It's for all situations, not just external, as we com combat the world, but also this captivity needs to take place within us. It needs to, it needs, needs to take place within me. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We refute the lofty, unbiblical uh, masquerade as truth, worldly wisdom. You take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. See, the, our object of our warfare and our tools is to change how people think. So they and we can no longer be captive to the lies of the world. To take captive. To take captive is also what I just read in Romans chapter 7 when Paul's saying, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I wind up doing. He writes, there is a war within my flesh, within my body. Waging war against the law of my, my mind, making me captive to the law of sin. The human condition, our condition, even as Christians, even as Christians. How many were baptized, when they, when they came to Christ, let's say, and you know, we teach repentance, confession, baptism. Uh, when you came to Christ, how many of you thought, man, I am, this is going to be great. And, and it is great, but and thought, boy, I'm, you're not thinking I'm on easy street, but you're thinking everything's taken care of, right? And how many learned another lesson after I, yeah, isn't it? Isn't it? It's like, whoa, I mean, everything is great. We're saved. We're in Christ, but boy. Because even for Christians, even for Christians, we're saved from our sin, the consequences of sin, but it's not that we are not still on this earth battling. 
while we're in these bodies. I like John MacArthur. He says, here's the answer. Just get rid of the bodies, right? Yeah, there you go. Just get rid of the bodies. And we one day will because we will have new bodies, right? That's the whole point. So the human condition. But here we're called to take every cap a thought captive to make it obedient to Christ for ourselves and the world because the battle is for the mind. And that's why in Romans we're told to be, be transformed by the renewing of your minds, minds right? In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul uh, wrote, considering um, putting away the old self, putting on the new so self in the attitude of your minds, okay? And we read, in your anger do not sin, do not let the sun go down while, while you are still angry, which we're pretty familiar with, but this one here. And do not give the devil a what? Foothold. foothold. A foothold. Now there's, depending on the translation you have, there's a lot of different translations when you look at the original word. And some uh, do not give place, do not give room, uh, do not give opportunity, <coughs> do not give a scope for acting out. There's one suggestion for this word for foothold or do not give a place. The word in the original language is, uh, is the uh, Greek word tapas which we get the word topography from, uh, meaning a place or a location. Uh, and we could maybe think of base of operation even. Do not give the devil a, here it is, jurisdiction, an opportunity. And it made a lot of sense to me, because if you ever watch some of those um, crime shows, ever see some of those crime shows? <laughs> where you know, you've got the police working with the FBI, or they can't go into a certain arena, a certain geographical place, because they, they do not have jurisdiction. You ever hear? See, that's what Paul was writing here. See, just like those, in those crime shows, they can't go, you can't do something, they can, because they do not have jurisdiction. They have no power. And so what Paul is saying, do not give the devil a foothold, do not give him jurisdiction. Do not give him power in your life. Do not give him a place or opportunity. And just to show that even the first century Christians, not unlike us, uh, if you're taking the few that are taking the Greek class, this is present active um, imperative. It's present, it's continual. Active means you're doing it or not doing it. And it's an imperative, a command. So he's saying, uh, do not continually give the devil jurisdiction. Do not give him continually a foothold. And he's writing to the first century church. And that's why James even says, and he writes, I should say, uh, submit yourselves to submit yourselves there, there then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Too often we submit ourselves not to God, and, and there's only one thing left, it's the world. But submit yourselves to, then to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. And I love this. Come near to God and he will come near to you. And I'll tell you, we go through this. Today we feel really close to God, don't we? We've been singing. We're together as the body of Christ, right? It feels great. But sometimes, have you ever had that? I, I've, I've talked to people. I've felt this. You ever feel dry in your relationship with God? Just raise your hands, would you? Because we're interactive here. We know your names and where you live, your phone numbers and... We've got your social security number, everything, you know. Yeah, yeah but isn't that true, though? We just feel dry. We feel dry. And, uh, and we say, oh, gosh, just, what's going on? I just feel so dry. I don't feel good. Come near to God. He will come near to you. And there's that little thing we always throw back. Well, we're, did God leave? No. But for some reason, we took off. We backed off. So submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will uh, draw near to you or come near to you. So we demolish arguments that are in the world. We take captives every thought. How do we demolish these arguments and these pretensions that go against the knowledge of God? Here it is. Hebrews. Let's read this one together. Three, two, one. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow, it judges the thought and attitudes of the heart. And I think we could almost say the attitudes of the heart, the mind. Not, not out of place. 
this is what demolishes arguments and pretenses of the world that sets itself against God. And what about taking captive our thoughts? Uh, I think the best example, the best example, is what Peter wrote in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, talking about when Jesus was actually on the cross. He was on the cross. Bearing our sins, by the way. Talk about the different weapons of the world and of Christians, and even Christ himself. When they, the mankind, men, hurled their insults at him, isn't that the way of the world? Isn't that the weapons that we face as, at the, as the church today, don't we? When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. That was his weapon. When he suffered, of course, at the hands of men, their weapons, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He entrusted himself. And isn't that what it's really all about? Isn't that the same issue that goes all the way back to the garden? Trusting God or trusting the voice or voices of the world around you? So there's two powerful points as we're looking at these scriptures today. One is that we need to be taken captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And second, we need to entrust ourselves to him who judges justly, because I, I have this, this suspicion that what happens at those really rough moments with these strongholds in our lives is that we don't think God has uh, our best interest. Or maybe we don't think he is able to pull us through. Maybe we think he wants to withhold something from us, and that is the same lie that has gone all the way back to the garden, that he is withholding something from us. He is the one who judges justly. When Jesus began his ministry, uh, he was baptized. 40 days in the a desert experience. He went to the synagogue and on the Sabbath he read from the book of Isaiah. He read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives. That's us, or once were. I'd like to answer that question that, we, that Paul really asked early on that we didn't have an answer to from Romans chapter 7 when we, we began. Uh, Paul will actually answer it, but let's, let's go back to it. Paul writes, For I, do, I uh, know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh, for I want to do the good, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but I do the very evil I do not want. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer me doing it, but sin that lives in me. So I find the law that when I want to do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see a different law in my members or in the flesh, waging war against the law of my mind. Remember, that's where the battleground is, right? But I see a different law in the members waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that is in my flesh, my members. Now I just want to say this though before we go any further as we close this part up. Is that, note that the tension that we have while we're in this flesh, in this body, there will always be that tension. Okay. There will always be that tension. But the answer to all the problems is this. When Paul says, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? And his answer is, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because Jesus came to set the captives free. 